So today we are discussing chapter 12 of geostatistical data for the book lab about uh, spatial statistics for data science of Paula Moraga. The learning objectives are to understand the concepts of geostatistical data and Gaussian random fields, to be able to define the Gaussian random fields correlation structure and simulate um, Gaussian random fields and also to explore the correlation structure of a given Gaussian random field by plotting the semivariate gram. So this was a very interesting chapter. And, and it's also the first chapter about the part about um, geostatistical data. So I think there are about four or five chapters in this part. And so geostatistical data, uh, Contrary to aerial data, which we have seen in the previous part, just as the data or observations of a spatially continuous variable collected at specific locations. So we actually have a random process Z, which is a uh, well, which is present everywhere. And we only have observation from specific locations. So examples can be air pollution or temperature levels taken at a set of monitoring stations. So we always have observations at specific locations. And often we want to infer the characteristics of the spatial process, such as the mean and variability, the spatial variability, as well as use it, this information to predict the process at unsampled locations so uh, that we can actually predict a value for every location. This chapter will be about Gaussian random fields, so that will come in a minute. And then the following chapters are uh, about approaches for spatial interpolation. So in chapter 13, it's about simple spatial interpolation methods, such as inverse distance weighted method. Chapter 14 is about Krieging. Chapter 15 is about model-based geostatistics. And then in chapter 16, I believe it's quite a shorter chapter, if not mistaken, it's to evaluate the predictive performance of uh, these uh, interpolation models or methods. All right, so for chapter 12, we discussed the Gaussian random fields, and well, these are and uh, statistical uh, data anyway. So it's a set of random variables uh, Z for each location SI, where observations occur in a continuous domain. So this is really just uh, statistical data, but an uh, extra condition in Gaussian random fields is that every finite collection of random variables, so that's a specific subset of locations, has a multivariate normal distribution. So they are all normally distributed. And there can be more properties uh, of these Gaussian random fields, which we actually like, because then we can apply certain methods. Uh, Gaussian random fields can be strictly stationary if the Z process is invariant to spatial shifts, which means that you in each place you, you get the same distribution. But often we will use weekly stationary uh, Gaussian random fields, which this is a bit more relaxed. It's just that there is a constant mean everywhere for the process. Sometimes these are actually the residuals, so it can be modeled with some covariates, and then we have this for the residuals. So then for, for residuals, we would have a, a constant mean of zero. But so that is then the weekly stationary variable. Um, and another aspect of weekly stationary uh, Gaussian random fields is that um, the covariances between locations, uh, they depend on only on the differences between locations, uh, which is, um, well, it's the H, the difference is expressed by H uh, between two locations. So it's the, about the covariance between the z value on location s and between and the z value on a location s plus h. And 
that at least involves the distance uh, between locations, but also the direction. But if it only involves the distance, which means that direction doesn't matter, then the process is called isotropic. Uh, in the other case, we call it anisotropic. So the covariance, it will be, um, it will be symbolized by a capital C and the yeah, H as being the um, property. So the difference between two locations that determines the covariance. So that is typical of weekly stationary processes. They can moreover be intrinsically stationary, uh, which means it's a subset of weekly stationary in which also the variogram is solely determined by the distance between two locations. So it's, it's uh, again that H, which we have here, but um, the covariance, it is, uh, I mean, the variogram, it is the variance of the Z values between two locations. So it's the variability, is a spatial variability of the Z value between two locations. So, and it does depend both on the, spatial variance and the covariance, which we can see later. But the fact that it's solely dependent on distance and also the covariance is solely dependent on uh, distance and the process has a constant mean. So th these combinations make it intrinsically stationary. Covariance functions of the Gaussian random field, it is what describes the spatial correlation structure of the Gaussian random field. So it's, it's a relationship uh, between the distance and the covariance, and um, it can have various forms. And so the covariance function type and its parameters are needed if you want to simulate a Gaussian random field. So we have that the correlation dependent on distance, it is um, the covariance divided by the spatial variance, but uh, in practice, it's actually the correlation function that is defined and the covariance function, which is derived um, after it. So we, in the book, we will find that the covariance, so it's just a derivation, but the, it's just another representation of this formula. So which the covariance can be calculated or derived from the correlation by multiplying it with the spatial variance. And the general form for correlation functions in, uh, in spatial statistics, it's the matter family of correlation functions. Um, and well, I'm not familiar with all the mathematics involved in this uh, rather complex formula, but this, I think it's the modified Bessel function of the second kind, which I'm not really uh, familiar with, but I found that this is a exponentially decaying function. So it means this function is applied to this argument. So H is distance, phi is, is some constant, so to speak, and it's exponentially decaying. So it, if distance, increases, this will decrease. And that's important because uh, this really uh, matters then for the correlation, which means that with higher distances, the correlation between the Z values will be lower, which is what you would expect in a spatial autocorrelation. So the phi, it is the range parameter. And this means the range is the distance um, for which um, within which there is still some spatial correlation, but where distance is higher than the five um, value or far, or higher than the range, um, then you don't have any covariance, so correlation anymore. And um, so the spatial variability then is solely determined by the spatial variance and is at its maximum, which we will also see later. Uh, the new uh, parameter, it is a smoothing parameter. So, and it does, this, this um, expression can be simplified in some cases uh, when, for example, the smoothing parameter new is 0 0.5. 
we have a more simplified exponential expression and that's also true if it is uh, yeah infinite all right so when we multiply the correlation function with the spatial variance then we will obtain the covariance between two locations and so that's what we have here the covariance um calculated with the matter uh, correlation function um, for three values of pi and with the spatial variance set as one. So if the distance is zero, so we have maximum correlation of one uh, multiplied by spatial variance of one. So we have a covariance of one uh, while well, it, it will get lower and lower for higher distances because then the correlation uh, becomes, uh, well, in the end it will become zero and we just uh, have a zero covariance. And then um, the phi will determine uh, whether autocorrelation or the covariance only occurs after for a shorter distance, like uh, the low value, it's for a short distance. Uh, while in the case of phi is one, it is for a, a much larger distance that we still have covariance. We can calculate uh, values of the covariance function using the cov.spatial function from the GUR package. So for example, um, we set the spatial variance as one and the phi as 0 0.2, though it is just for one of the curves, it's actually the middle curve of this slide. We feed a distance vector to the function. So here, this means a vector of 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and so on uh, uh, to one. And we calculate the the corresponding covariance with the cov.spatial function um, using this distance vector, setting the sigma square and the phi parameters of the covariance function. We define uh, the covariance model as a matter because there are quite a lot of other possibilities available. And the kappa, it is the new um, smoothing parameter of the previous formula and the 0 0.5 in the default actually. I've, all, I've also calculated another one with a kappa set of 10. So let's see what comes out. So we have the distances in the first column of this table and then the covariances which we can see and match with the curve in the previous slides because that's for the, the default kappa. And then a covariance two with the higher kappa, we can see that the covariance is not um, decreasing as fast. Then once we have uh, determined which parameters we want to use for the covariance function, we can also simulate the Gaussian random field. So a Gaussian random field. Um, so it will really return Z values and so simulate the spatial process. It uses the GRF uh, function from the GOR package. And so what you have to provide is the number of points, so spatial points in the simulation. And then you should say if it should be arranged as a regular grid, which it will try to do by default. It's the default value, the reg. Um, or you can also provide coordinates. The x and the y limbs are the limits in the x and y direction. So it's the minimum and the maximum value for x and for y. Um, and the default is to just spread out everything between 0 and 1. So if you just provide an n value, which is um, uh, as a regular number, it will be uh, try to spread it out um, in a regular grid between zero and one for the X and the Y values. So just as with the cov.spatial function, the cov.model takes the type of correlation function and the cov.parse takes the covariance parameters uh, sigma square and phi. And it also um, accepts the kappa smoothness parameter, uh, which is required by some of the correlation functions. 
So it's, these were just the same as with the cough.spatial uh, function. So let's try. We use the same values as before, and we calculate for a regular grid with 1,024 uh, locations. It is the example from the book, which means that we use a grid for of uh, 32 by 32 um, yeah, positions. And yeah, we use the Mattern correlation function with these uh, covariance parameters. So it confirms by its messages that it's, it's generating these grids. And it has a process with one covariance structure. And it provides uh, several other um, aspects of its algorithm. And yeah, it has just created one realization. When we have a look at the data elements of this result, we can see that indeed this is just a vector of the number of um, simulation or simulated um, locations that we have asked and which implicitly must be arranged along the grid of 32 by 32 um, positions. So this is the result. So we do have some spatial autocorrelation. We can var vary the phi parameter uh, as in the book and then you can see with the phi parameter of one there is there's spatial correlation over a longer distance than compared with the 0 0.2, which we have calculated. And if you set it very low, there is very few spatial correlation, uh, practically none, I think, at this scale. So this means that you have a very bumpy pattern because there's practically no spatial correlation or only at a very, very short distance in this case. So this is a way to simulate Gaussian random fields. Now we are turning to summarize the correlation structure of a given Gaussian random field. So for actual data, for example. So in an intrinsically stationary Gaussian random field, the variance of the difference between two z values is a function of the distance h, as we have defined before. And the variogram, it is the variance of um, yeah, the difference between two z values of two locations. So, and this variance is called the variogram. And it is in effect the average squared difference of z values since we have a constant mean and the uh, the squared average of the mean is zero. So this, this is a second term that actually is, can be dropped in calculating this variance. And the semi-variogram um, is just the half of the variogram, as you can see here. And it has uh, the uh, special property that it will um, be the spatial variance once the autocorrelation has dropped to zero so which we can see when it is plotted so um, we can estimate it with the empirical variogram so it's a tool that which you can use to evaluate the presence of spatial correlation in data and what we are doing to do well what we need to do this because we have a limited a finite uh, number of points with data we have to bin the um, distances and for each bin, see how many um, yeah, data we have. So that's the NH. And for this group, for this subgroup, for this bin of distances, we do take the average of um, the square differences between each pair of locations. So this is in, in effect a estimate for this formula. So then we can um this will be for this specific bin it's semi value uh, the variogram in this case because it's the it has the coefficient two here so the variogram of a specific bin uh, will be the mean of these uh, square differences uh, for all pairs that occur in the distant bin so we can plot the results when we have many data, we can 
smooth it. And then we have the semi-valued RAM as a function of distance. And the range is the area in which there is a lower semi-valued RAM. So the variability between two different locations is lower simply because they are more similar to each other. So the closer they are to, to each other, the more similar they are. And this means the value their their um, variability amongst each other is lower. So that's the semi variogram. So actually, the but their variability the variability of the of the difference between um, the two z values, so the variance of of this difference will increase, and it will increase up to being the actual spatial variance. So that's true for the um, halves. Um, so when we divide it by two, then we get exactly the spatial variance, which is called the sill. So it is where the semi-variogram will um, lead to. So at, and that is when the distance is larger than the range. So the range is the area where the semi variogram is lower and where we uh, say that there is still a spatial correlation. There is sometimes also a nugget effect, which can be because of measurement errors or uh, some other aspect happening at short distances where there is still a difference that remains. So these are typical terms of a semi variogram. Um, and we can, yeah, of course, with the GOR package, estimate these semi-variograms for the bind distances. And we use the varioc function of GOR. It has several arguments, uh, being uh, to start with the option arguments, importantly, because uh, binning is not the only option. It is a default, and it will return values of a bin semi-variogram. But it can also take the cloud value, which will return the semi-variogram cloud. And what is that? It is actually the data before averaging inside the bin. So it, it means for each um, yeah, point pair, we have the distance between those two points. And we can calculate the half of the squared difference of the z value for those two points. And this is just that. So it is actually the data behind the calculation of a semi-variogram for each bin. So we have many more points than we will have results per bin because for each bin, we have just one calculated semi-variogram. Then there's also the smooth option, which will return the kernel smoothed semi-variogram, which means um, the smooth uh, curve. The UVEC argument, it's actually not explicit in the book. But for it's for the very the bin variogram, it can be used to control the number of bins. So by default, 13 bins are calculate, calculated. But if you provide a scholar here, then that will be used as the number of bins. And I think you can also provide a vector to just define the position of the, the centers of the bins. But it's in the documentation of the function, of course. One can also define the max.dist argument, which is uh, actually done in the example in the book, to set a maximum distance for the semi-variogram. So in order to not take into account point pairs that are further, about, further apart than max.dist. Optionally, one can also define the mean part of the model, in which case residuals will be taken uh, to um, yeah to to show or to calculate the semi variogram the default is that the mean is assumed constant over the region so trend is cte trend can be fitted using ordinary least squares and then as said the variograms will be computed using the residuals so let's apply this in the example so in the book 
the Parana data set is used. It is a data set of, I think, precipitation data from a from the Parana state in Brazil during a couple of years. And when we have a look at its components, it, it is a list and it has the first element of the list is actually a matrix of coordinates of 143 observations. I think it's uh, both spatially and temporally uh, distinct um, data. So the data, it's 143 observations. These are the values of the precipitation. And there's also data of the borders in the book. They also make a map and use this to actually draw the border with ggplots using the geompath function. And well, I'm not sure what this is, but I'm sure it will be documented in, um, yeah, in the documentation of the package. So let's calculate the value run. We have these coordinates, we have the data. And in this case, we use the cloud semi gram and we cut it at a maximum distance of 400. We assign it to the value cloud object. And let's have a look at the first two. There are quite a lot of elements in a value gram object, or exactly the semi value gram. And when we have a look, we can see that these two first elements, U and V, these are, I cannot just uh, know from this, but these are the distances and the semi variogram values. Well, in, in this case, it is just the squared differences of, an, uh, of the Z values divided by two. So which is what is used later to be binned in a bin semi variogram So we have quite a lot, a large number of point pairs that have been um, created by just saying it must be the cloud uh, type of semi variogram below a distance of 400. So this value will never be larger than 400. And these are the squared differences divided by two. While we can also use the default, which is the option bin, then we have the variog bin as a result. It also has the U and the V, but then we just get the values for 30 distances of the V, which then is the mean of the value that we have seen before belonging to that bin, bin distance. So that is in effect the, the empirical semi gram value for each of these distances. We can plot these and then we get the value of cloud and the value of bin um, plots as in the book uh, next to each other. So as expected, we have all values here in this case, and then we get these values for the semi value gram in, uh, in, in this case. So when that's all, I'm not sure if you have uh, any questions or remarks. Okay, so this this uh, last one is a semi biogram. Yeah. yeah, the bin, the bin one, it is the right one, right? Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't go. No, I've seen that. Yeah, I... I've I've not explored. Um, but we could try to do so. But I've not explored um other settings, which we actually should. I think we should try. For example, see what happens if we also allow larger distances. It would be, I okay. think, more logic to do that in this case. But maybe, I'm not sure, maybe it's because the total distances were not that much. But perhaps we, um, that perhaps we could uh, give it a try. Okay. Yes, we, we set a maximum distance of 400. Okay. So we actually cut out the the bar that it goes. Yes, yes, yes. We we know. we have always used the max of this is four hundred. So it's the reason, at least, why it does not go higher than four hundred. 
but we could uh, let's just try and see right we can um, let's try I'm just trying to zoom to begin. It doesn't really work, but maybe it was just because it wasn't active. Yeah, right. Um, let's, let's try. So we have this. Let's just comment out this and try again. But we can, let, let's just do it like this. So, and plot it right away. So we get this type of thing. We um, we could try to set the U vec to perhaps a lower value. I'm not sure. So let's just try this. Yeah. So I'm not sure, but I, my first guess would be that perhaps. There are not enough data here to uh -huh. to really model this well. What do you think? Mm -hmm. We could we could of course investigate uh, the the results and have a look uh, at the distribution and see how many um, data are in its bin. We can actually I think we can perhaps get an idea about that by using the clouds yeah so that's confirmed so we actually don't have a lot of data above the distance 400 so that explains why it's it's i think less reliable Further ideas or questions? I only use this very now. So I use this. I use this uh, diagram to identify what are what is the maximum distance that. Um, shows autocorrelation. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to model it, probably, yeah? OK. Yeah. But a spatial autocorrelation is allowed. Yes. Yes. So it, it's really defined. It's defined even, yes. In the Gaussian random field by the correlation function, in this case, the Matern correlation function which defines a correlation, a spatial correlation. So I, I expect it has been said in the chapter that these tools, because this is just definitions actually, and how you can fit a correlation function by uh, yeah, fitting a uh, semi-variogram. Uh, it is um, said in the book that these things will be used in following chapters. Okay. In, in the modeling process. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I don't have any other. Okay. Thank you very much.